Throughout this conversation, you're going to see a series of polls that are going to come up. Answer those at your leisure. All of those responses are anonymous, um, but they are important, and we are going to share your results uh, in the in the weeks that follow in an email. And as Hannah said, please do use the hashtag uh, call, hashtag call out misinfo uh, on your Twitter so that we can keep the conversation going um, around the world. So with that, uh, Caroline, let's go to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to briefly, as I said, touch on this research. I'm going to describe our approach, some trends that we're seeing, and some recommendations, five of each, five recommendations, five uh, trends, and a couple of spotlight uh, case studies that my colleague Caroline Logan is going to help us to understand. Um, and then we're going to dive in with our expert panel. Next slide, please. Uh, we're going to have the pleasure of being joined by President Takahiko Nakao, the former president of the Asian Development Bank, Marion Salzman, Senior Vice President at Phillips Morris International, and Tim Winninger, a great resource uh, professor and researcher on this very topic. So we're excited to have all three of them, and we're going to get to them as soon as we can. Next slide, please. So in order to do the research that we're going to present today, we went out and did a very extensive literature review. We tried to read as much as we could on the topic, and then we went out and held a series of private consultative roundtables uh, in various regions around the world. We had academics, we had think tank experts, we had people from industry, from civil society, from media, from government agencies, uh, and other local country governments. In these roundtables, we held them in the United States, in Latin America, in Japan, in the EU, and in the UK, uh, and in Sub-Saharan Africa so far. We still have a couple more to go. We're going to do one for the ASEAN region and another one in, um, in the MENA region uh, upcoming, and others may follow. But what you're going to see today is a quick uh, highlight of some of the things that we've learned so far. So let's go to the next slide. So five trends. The first trend is that evolving technologies drive evolving definitions of misinformation and disinformation. And this has led to a decline in trust in experts and information. These new technologies, digital technologies, have created unfettered access to information, which on the whole has been a very positive thing for the world. But it also requires information users to distinguish between misinformation, which is an untruth, versus disinformation, a deliberately spread mistruth. Sometimes we can spread misinformation unwittingly, or sometimes we are, uh, uh, so somebody or a bad actor can deliberately try to spread that information, that misinformation. And that's the distinction that we think is very important here is to distinguish between misinformation, something that is untrue, and disinformation, something that is untrue that is deliberately spread. And what we've also seen is that through these digital technologies, we've enabled a greater level of transparency into what were previously closed processes like science and public policy making. And what that has caused is a dissonance in many of our minds because what we thought were hard facts, things that aren't going to change, suddenly can change as new science comes to light or new evidence comes to light. Many of us lived through this when we went from a original finding that masks were not required in public during COVID the early stages of COVID-19 to mask mandates. And this is because of new science coming to light and changes that resulted in public policy. But those kinds of changes leave some people wondering who they can trust as we make policy and do science live on TV in many cases. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and I'll turn it to you, Caroline, to give us a quick uh, case study on this topic. Great. Thanks, Richard. So as you mentioned, greater transparency has a lot of benefits, but it also has a downside as people are seeing these issues like science and public policy that they thought were fixed, um, that they can evolve and it really shakes their confidence. So malign actors took advantage of this transparency transparency during COVID, especially um, as public health officials were changing their instructions, as Richard mentioned. Often they were flooding the space to cause confusion. And oftentimes you saw the same source providing the opposite message, which breeds a lot of distrust and leads individuals to view credible sources with skepticism. And as a result, they rely on new sources of information, which are not necessarily grounded in science. As Richard mentioned, mask wearing is a great example. In our Japanese um, roundtable, we heard participants emphasize that Japan had a shared cultural understanding of masks um, as a first line of defense in the spread of disease. 
Whereas in the US, mask wearing was quite politicized, um, causing confusion around the data and the science that supported their use. Back to you, Richard. Thanks, Caroline. Our second trend is that the acceleration of digital technologies also has spread the uh, speed at which lies can spread. As I said before, more people have unfettered access to information, and that means that more people know more than ever before. This has unlocked a huge potential for improving lives, but at the same time, as Winston Churchill once said, a lie can go around the world before the truth has a chance to put its pants on. Uh, so that means that a well-constructed lie, especially one that is grounded slightly in the truth, can, uh, can, can spread much faster than a complicated truth. So the access to digital technologies has made it easier and less costly to spread misinformation and disinformation. Next slide, please. Back to you, Caroline, for the case study. Great. Because many Africa-based media rely on global news networks for some of their coverage, we've seen a deficit in Afrocentric journalism, which leads to a lack of properly contextualized information, and this in turn leads to a misperception of risk. So what we found in our research and heard from participants in roundtables is that oftentimes Western and Eurocentric media uh, have long covered Africa as a troubled continent, emphasizing its uh, difficulties more than its opportunities. This has um, led many people and especially businesses and investors to overestimate the actual risk of living, working and doing business in Africa. And this has really had a great impact um, on the market and subsequent economic development. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, the next trend, trend number three, is that the digital world erases standards we are used to in the physical world. The standard for the limits of free speech was for many people established in uh, uh, Schenck versus the United States in 1919, a Supreme Court case. And Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes at the time, in his opinion, uh, established the idea of that shouting fire in a crowded theater determined the limit of free speech. The challenge with that limit and that definition in the digital world is that it is very much a definition grounded in the physical world. If all of the things in that statement, shouting fire in a crowded theater, are all physically and separately verifiable. Did I yell fire? Was the theater crowded? Was there a fire or not? All of those are physically verifiable truths that are almost immediately uh, fact checkable. But in the digital world, that standard no longer applies because we're oftentimes dealing with, uh, with facts or opinions that are difficult or impossible to verify in any kind of physical way, in any sort of immediate way. So without physically verifiable facts or the ability to quickly fact check opinions, uh, we have a different, we, we are left with a standard that really applies in the analog world and not one in the digital world. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this leads into our fourth trend, which is that the regulating the flow of information is increasingly challenging. Our laws, regulations, and corporate policies are still built for that analog world, and it's taken decades of jurisprudence and policymaking and legislating and regulating to build up the rules that we use to govern uh, speech and, and expression and communication in the physical world those are still lagging behind where we are with the space, with the pace and scale and sophistication of how these technologies are used today, both for good and for malign purposes. Next slide, please. And this is our last trend. Um, and that what we're seeing is that there is a continuing inability to address psychology, basic human psychology, in how these tech platforms and regulatory frameworks actually operate. While propaganda has long been a tool of statecraft, Digital media has made it incredibly cheap and effective for nation states and other malign actors to have an outsized impact through disinformation. At the same time, when, and that, what that's really done is that's kind of put the responsibility right now back onto the individual to distinguish between what is misinformation and disinformation. But when we make something everyone's responsibility, we've really made it no one's responsibility. Tech platforms rightly ca remain cautious about assuming responsibility for curating the accuracy of information or for determining the intent and in spreading it for fear of stepping into a morass of censorship. To help sidestep the censorship debacle while still making progress, some of our participants in our roundtable discussions suggested taking aim at what is truly different in the tech platforms. 
versus earlier forms of mass communication, namely the unfettered access speed and scale they provide. Individuals have the rights to their own opinions, but not to the unfettered fast and broad distribution of those opinions. So we need to look at how we can regulate the underlying technology that powers these platforms, like the algorithms that determine what people see and how information gets distributed. Um, and we may, we'll, we're gonna look at that as a policy alternative in our next section. Um, last case study over to you, Caroline. Thanks, Richard. So in the European Union, um, we heard a lot about a hesitancy, as Richard mentioned, to um, remove content, given the history around censorship, particularly in Eastern Europe. So during COVID, uh, the EU found that it had to revisit these considerations and remove false information that was causing harm um, when it came to public health. They really focused in on the tech uh, platforms and worked on flooding the space with facts to seek to outweigh uh, the misinformation that was out there. So quickly, I want to touch on our five recommendations. And the first recommendation that we have is, if we can go to the next slide, is to build autonomic responses through awareness and nudging. Uh, you know, the topic of this conversation is media literacy. And one of the challenges we see with literacy is that, again, we're trying to educate a public to do something that isn't necessarily an active thing that they think about every day. So what we need to do, uh, you know, sort of is figure out how to utilize both the technology platforms and our basic psychological makeup to our advantage. Right now, the bad guys, the malign actors are able to use these tech platforms in ill ways because they're doing that very thing. They're taking advantage of the ways that the platforms operate and the ways that our own psychology operates to kind of hijack some of our uh, psychological systems and play to our worst instincts. What we're suggesting is that there are ways to do that better and to do that in, for, for good. So we need to use education and some tech enabled nudges to encourage more unconscious and autonomic and automatic responses to misinformation. As an example, Twitter has introduced a pause button in helping to, um, before somebody forwards uh, a link that they haven't read, to cause them to think twice before sharing that information. So we're recommending that we use targeted media literacy so that providers um, can utilize new tools and guidelines to um, help students and help users develop healthy habits. The social media platform should think about how they can create these kinds of nudges while mass media needs to be thinking about verifying information um, and, and sharing, sharing verified information over speed and the sensationalism of reporting. Right now, we're seeing a growing culture of prioritizing speed of reporting and sensationalism of reporting over accuracy of reporting. That still doesn't remove our individual responsibility that we need to make sure that um, we are being responsible consumers distributors and curators of information. In the modern digital landscape, in many cases, we are our brother or sister's editor and curator, and we need to take that responsibility seriously. Uh, next recommendation. Uh, the good guys, that is to say, those people who are trying to fight misinformation and disinformation need the same kinds of tools and greater, that they can operate at greater speed and scale. Right now, many of the folks who are trying to spread disinformation or misinformation are making better use of some of the best parts of these technologies, be it AI or uh, bots or other, other technologies to spread misinformation, disinformation. We need to take those, those tools and weapons back um, onto our side of the fight. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we need to focus on what is truly different in, in, in these, these digital platforms Rather than trying to get into the dis debate over who, who is responsible for censoring or curating information, we should focus in on the fact that these tools are provide greater scale and distribution while ensuring an open marketplace of ideas. So we would look at how regulators could develop standards in the digital era that ensure that institutions can enforce them. And to look at, as I said before, the underlying technology that, uh, that enables the sharing and spreading of information. And we also need international organizations to step in and develop internationally agreed upon standards that recognize the evolving nature of these issues. Which brings us to recommendation number four, uh, that we need to have longitudinal studies to look at policy effectiveness. While we're calling today for uh, greater international standards on these issues, 
we also recognize that different countries and regions are going to take different approaches. And so what we should have is a, as, a, as an academic and think tank backbone that is looking at which policies are actually more effective over time and then adopt those into international standards. So if the EU wants to go one way, the US another and Japan a third, that's fine, but let's study those different policy approaches and see what actually works. Last uh, recommendation. Uh, we need to invest in an objective, credible and fact-checking ecosystem. Right now, we are relying in large part on human intervention for credible fact checking. That, as I said before, means that the bad guys are always gonna outgun the good guys because they're using AI and scalable technologies that we are not currently using. And we need to bring those technologies online for uh, combating misinformation and disinformation. But we also need a robust fact checking ecosystem in social media in local journalists and in civil society organizations and community leaders who can really check in on this. And that is in some ways easy, I shouldn't say, or maybe easier to do in the open platforms that get a lot of attention like Facebook and Twitter and uh, WeChat, where it's becoming increasingly more difficult are in closed platforms um, like WhatsApp and others where you, you can't see what's being ch ch chatted in public. So we need to also address the, the shifting nature of these technologies. So those are our five trends and our five recommendations. I wanna stop talking and I wanna really bring in our great expert panelists now to have a conversation about those and get their reflections. Uh, I'm so pleased that, uh, that President Nakao, uh, Marion Salzman and Tim Winninger are with us today. Uh, President Nakao, you are the chairman of the Institute at Mizuho Research and Technologies and the former president of the Asian Development Bank. You previously served as vice finance minister uh, finance for international affairs, and we're in charge of foreign exchange markets, G20 and G7 processes, the ASEAN plus three financial cooperation, and bilateral financial relations with the United States. You're also a renowned speaker, writer, and professor. Um, I'd really like to get your reflections on these findings um, overall, but especially how they compare with your experience in Japan and Southeast Asia. As, as um, Caroline touched on the case studies, one of the trends we spotted was the, the power of technology to spread both facts and lies. And we saw that play out in the United States during COVID-19. I know Japan had a very different experience. Um, how are you seeing these things play out uh, in Japan? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I'm pleased to join this session because I'm so concerned about the impact of uh, the technologies or uh, social medias on our democracy because uh, we need uh, freedom of speeches and the media, but at the same time, uh, we must be careful about uh, damaging uh, the uh, privacy and also the uh, insightful, uh, thoughtful thinking over the instinctive, uh, very uh, speedy reactions of the people. So in that regard, I'm so interested in these discussions. And uh, of course, untrue information uh, damages the society by, for instance, uh, untrue uh, information about the medicine, for instance. And second, of course, uh, it damages the privacy or even life of the people if uh, uh, certain flaming of uh, the exaggerations of uh, characters uh, causes uh, attack on that uh, uh, actress or whoever. And it happened in Japan. One athlete uh, made a suicide because of the attack, uh, because of exaggerated uh, uh, expression of a character uh, 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 over her. So we must be uh, careful about it. And also, uh, it also causes uh, trouble to, once again, the uh, uh, very speedy reaction instead of a thoughtful thinking uh, based on the responsible media, uh, professional academicians and so on. People start uh, acting as if they are media themselves. And of course, there is a, a advantage of it because uh, in a way, uh, it can correct uh, the uh, misinformation, untrue information also. Com compared to the time that we don't have any communication, at that moment, there was a kind of a spread of a rumor and so on, which can uh, uh, be uh, untrue and which cannot be uh, uh, corrected. So uh, the technology is always have a pros and cons, and there is a correcting part or uh, enlightening part, but at the same time, there are uh, uh, damaging part. And in case of Japan, I don't know much about uh, Southeastern Asian countries' uh, conditions in this respect, but as far as Japan is concerned, uh, because the society is uh, less divided in terms of income, education, 
jobs and uh, uh, regions, ethnicities, and religion. So, uh, and also Japanese people tend to have a more kind of moderate attitude toward anything. So uh, in Japan, there is no such thing as an attack on the Congress or uh, the idea that we don't need a mask. Uh, in case of Japan, I would say that the problem is more about uh, there is less different opinion. So uh, in, in, the, in the US, uh, there is a very strong uh, conservative, uh, fiscal conservative, which doesn't like a uh, deficit, which doesn't like uh, expansion of fiscal policy. But in Japan, almost all people are happy to have a more expansion of fiscal policies because uh, there is no seriously conservative uh, factions in the society. So there are many uh, ways to look at this, but I think uh, this is a very important topic to discuss to uh, maintain strength of a democracy, which is uh, really important the basis for market economy as well as social welfare, wellness. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, so what I'm hearing from you is that we can look at these things, and they, they almost always cut two ways, where uh, people can be spreaders of mistruth, but they can also be combaters of mistruth. We need these technologies um, to help us uh, enlighten, but we also need to be careful of the downsides like cyberbullying and things like that that can spread that information. Uh, the difference between Japan and, and how perhaps the United States dealt with these issues is grounded in the fact that you're looking at a more homogeneous and, and more equal society, uh, both in terms of income as well as um, uh, uh, education and other key factors. And the Japanese people are by nature moderate, um, but that also can also cut a different way because uh, you have homogeneity can also mean sameness of opinion. And uh, while that means perhaps more calm, but it also means less um, perhaps diversity, less, uh, less uh, innovation and other things That's like right. that. Thank you, sir. Uh, at Marianne Salzman, I want to bring you into this conversation. Uh, Marianne, you are the Senior Vice President at Philip Morris International, where you lead the communications helping PMI rid the world of cigarettes. You bring uh, a lot to that really big reputation and communications challenge, having worked previously as CEO of Havas uh, PR North America and global chair there. Um, and, and you have a really strong track record of building and expanding markets and increasing revenue. Uh, but I wanna bring this question to you because you know, one of the findings in our research was that when we do science and make policy in public, it can undermine trust. And you know, 50 years ago, scientists and doctors, some of them paid by the tobacco industry, told people tobacco was safe. Then a different group of scientists and doctors came in and said, well, man, no, it's not. Uh, and now we've got new science coming on saying, well, maybe that there are healthier or less risky alternatives that um, can, help, can help with uh, abating smoking and abating the, uh, the negative impacts of tobacco use. So I think people are left kind of wondering who to trust and how to trust. Uh, similar to nuclear power and the oil and gas industry, and you've got these new technologies that with the potential to reduce risk and improve health, human health. But I think many people have a fixed image of Philip Morris International and of tobacco companies um, and, and that they shouldn't trust them. So how are you tackling that? Let, let me take a quick step back. First of all, um, thank you for allowing us this platform. Um, thank you for at least engaging in a civil and civilized dialogue, because that's really the first step in our reshaping our reputation, but more importantly, in putting ourselves out there, because I think as one of your recommendations calls out, um, the only way for credible science to be credibly challenged is to go into an open marketplace and let others fact check us. Uh, that's what we believe in when we put our documentation out there for the FDA and others to go through millions of pages of documentation is to say, hang on, here's what we believe to be true, but you better check our work or we expect you to check our work or we know you're going to check our work because the, um, the authorizations that come along with that fact checking are what take it from being our um, contention to in fact being closer to being fact-based and ultimately to being uh, accepted as fact. I, I think when you look at what's happened during um, COVID in particular, we saw for the first time corporate science actually emerging as a viable category of science. I think if you think about what we all thought of Big Pharma, they were probably my twin, along with maybe Big Tech uh, uh, two years ago. And suddenly we've seen um, pharma science now today amongst the more respected, and certainly amongst maybe more enlightened people. I know I certainly felt really, really good when the governor of Connecticut told me 
I was eligible for my Pfizer shot. I wanted to write a thank you letter to the governor, to the CEO of Pfizer, to the scientists that worked on it in Germany, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that what we have is an evolving ecosystem. Um, there is plenty of reason to be skeptical. I encourage anyone to be skeptical of all corporate science, of all science, but that's what scientists do. It's an art and a science, it's constant skepticism, it's checking and balancing, it's accepting that someone's work is their best and hopefully the product they can produce with the highest level of integrity, but then you trust and verify. I think, was it President Reagan who told us to trust and verify? And I think that's the same exact kind of rigor I beg you to put us to, um, at this stage in our corporate history, um, we are just encouraging you to engage with us, um, take what we have to say, and then go out and try to prove us. We, we, I'd encourage you to prove us right, not to say prove us wrong, but come back, come with us and prove us right. Um, nothing would make me happier than for you to come with a great deal of skepticism, but a smile on your face and saying, I don't expect you to be right. And six, nine, 12, 18 months later say, wow, this is a great surprise. Philip Morris is telling me the truth. We've seen a lot more of that in recent years than you would expect because our commitment to science is profound. And I think it, it's, it's also the commitment of a lot of modern age companies that recognize that we're living in an age of transparency. We are living in an age of forthrightness. We're also living in an age where we recognize that the world is a pretty miserable place and we all have got to strive to do better and be better and accomplish more. And the best way to do it is, and it's kind of tied up in a lot of your recommendations, Richard, it's about combating disinformation. It's about raising awareness. It's about nudging people to um, work together to find better solutions. Mm -hmm. It's about putting stuff into these ecosystems. It's about looking for policies that force um, people to constantly improve and constantly revise and refine and look for better answers, better science. Excellent. So it's so, it, yeah. it's keep challenging us. I mean, I think my response to you is I hope to God we're doing a good job, but keep forcing us to do better. <laughs> um, thank you, Marianne. So what I'm taking away from that, I think there's several things that uh, we can kind of extrapolate from what you said that apply to, to Philip Morris International, but also more broadly. I think one of the things I heard there was that uh, be skeptical, but be civil. And let's come and have a, a conversation about these things challenge us, uh, challenge uh, anything, wh whoever science it is, whether it's uh, government science, corporate science, uh, academic science, challenge that, but do that in a civil way. Uh, and if we wanna restore civil, civil discourse to, to our society, that's kind of where it starts. I, I think that, you know, my grandmother used to say, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. I'm gonna actually enhance that with, if you wanna criticize my science, just do it with the same level of decorum, you would criticize another scientist's science. That's all we ask for. Excellent. The other thing I'm hearing there is that we need to make some key investments in public policy, in fact checking, in these ecosystems that would help us. Um, and that, Tim, I want to take to you. Um, Tim Winninger, you are uh, an associate professor at Notre Dame, where you research social media and artificial intelligence to better understand how humans create and consume information, especially in online social systems. You've won multiple awards and grants from numerous prestigious institutions, including the National Science Foundation, the US Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the US Army Research Office, and the US De Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, many people credit with the co creation of the internet. Um, and you currently lead a USAID-sponsored program to advance media literacy in the digital area, which is how you and I first met. So I wanna take that challenge to you and ask you, you know, from what you're seeing in our, in, in our findings, and please be, I, I, I welcome the skepticism that Marianne uh, brought down for Philip Morris International. I welcome your skepticism on our findings and recommendations, but what are you seeing in the research and, and what can we be doing to build more into these ecosystems? And in particular, anything you see on autonomic responses that we can, we can create? Yeah, uh, th thank you, Richard. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to echo, or maybe not echo, but uh, enhance something that was, that was mentioned earlier about science. Uh, I, I want to, science is not a set of facts. Science is a process of determining our best estimate of, of the truth and, and facts. And so it, science is a process. And I think people are starting to understand that more and more as science has played out in real time over the past 18 months. Um, we've all followed, no one has ever followed 
as closely an FDI approval, an FDA approval process as much as they had over the past 18 months. I know I knew exactly where, what stage one, stage two, stage three trials were at. And my, my son's grade school teacher and my mother-in-law who are, they're following it too. And so uh, one thing that, one good thing that's come out of uh, the coronavirus and COVID pandemic is that we all kind of are understanding a bit more of the process of science and, and how those facts are determined. Um, now, to your point, uh, so I am running a handful of different uh, projects uh, in the Asian Pacific, especially around um, the Indo-Pacific and Indonesia. Um, we have two big things. Um, one is a media literacy program um, that encourages people to, so the basic way it works is that we were um, putting up ads on social media platforms um, that encourage people to behave better. Um, so you, you think in America, we have um, Smokey the Bear, right? Who would encourage you, is, he says, only you can prevent forest fires, right? In England, um, during World War II, there was the Keep Calm and Carry On campaign. Um, you might see more recently, it's the um, uh, Click It or Ticket seatbelt recommendations. Uh, we have the same kind of thing, um, but it's not, a, it's a, the alliteration is not in English, it's in, it's in Bahasa, Indonesian, that is, translates roughly to think before you share or recognize your reaction. Or um, if, if the question, if the headline is a question, the answer is no. Um, different kind of catchy catchphrases um, that um, people can uh, see and then maybe reflect upon their social media behavior. Um, one of the big things, that your, your question about what are we seeing? Um, one of the research that we're finding, um, uh, so I've actually been working with Facebook and Twitter um, a few years ago uh, in our research on uh, user behavior about, um, we find that 75% of people on Twitter and, and Reddit, uh, they share a news article before they read it. And it's like 95% on Facebook. So they see a headline, see a picture and share it. That link stays blue. No one clicks on it. They don't even read the comments. They just see that, agree with it and share it. And then we wonder why fake news spreads so much. Well, it's because we are the editors, as you said, Richard, we are the editors of our friends' news feeds. And so we have a responsibility that um, we have to keep in mind. Now, one final thing before I, I, I hand it back is that one thing that we're seeing a lot, uh, especially in the last year or two, are memes, imagery, not news stories, not headlines, but pictures. And a lot of information, especially a lot of kind of deep psychological information, um, and habits and behaviors are shared in imagery. And I'm not talking about deep fakes. I, I'm actually, I don't think deep fakes are that big of a deal. Maybe in the future they will be, but I haven't really seen, where are all the deep fakes? They don't, they're not really around right now. What we see instead are shallow fakes, images that are cropped or memes that have text imposed upon them. Um, and they drive a lot of behavior. Um, that's a big thing that we're looking at right now. And so we have some technological tools that are looking at uh, the rise of memes and imagery as a way of communication, especially in the Indo-Pacific um, uh, and, and globally broadly. So um, yeah, that's all, that's all for me. So what I'm hearing, Tim, is that uh, first of all, we've become more educated on the process of science. And that's something that I think is, is wholly for the good. And we need to continue to deepen our understanding of the fact that science doesn't necessarily mean that a fact is fixed in time. It is a way in which we are trying to establish the best version of what we know to be true at a given point in time, um, number one. And I think that that will help us with this issue about trust if, if, if facts change and, and therefore policies change. Um, the second thing I'm hearing from you is that uh, you know we, we need to be thinking about how we can use the same tools that um, I keep calling them the bad guys, which you can, you can say it's no oversimplification, but things like alliteration and uh, uh, catchphrases and things like that. And perhaps not worry so much about deep fakes, but more about these shallow fakes. And, and I wanna stick with stick on this issue for a second because my understanding of the, of the origin of the word meme is that it was derived from the idea of a fragment of a thought and that those fragments of thoughts similar to genes being a fragment of DNA um, have the ability to, to change minds. And it seems like they are changing minds. So how, what are you seeing out there? Like what, what can be done? What, what can either tech platforms, 
governments, uh, civil society, what, what can we do to either make better use of these? And this is something I, I'm really personally concerned with because I've got three, three teenage uh, children, all of whom are voracious consumers of memes. Uh, so so how, what do we do about that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, what can be done about uh, social media in general and, and memes more specifically, that, that's tough. And one thing that we can do is we actually have, so I run an artificial intelligence lab here at Notre Dame and we are looking at, um, we can tell a lot about um, how, a, how a meme was created and how it was, if it's being intentionally um, promoted by some adversary or some, like you say, a malign actor. And so we have technologies that we can use and then we can give those um, kind of our, our findings to media and to governments to say, hey, this is something that's going on. Our AI is not good enough to make a, a determination quite yet, but you, as um, a media person uh, can go and investigate. And that also goes to what can be done uh, more generally is to strengthen media. One of the things that we find, especially in America, is that a lot of small town newspapers um, have, have disappeared. Um, and there's no one watching the courthouse. And what we see take up, take up a space are these kind of fake news sites. Um, so if we just, uh, for example, I live in South Bend, Indiana. There's a small town outside of South Bend called Elkhart, a town of about 30,000 people. No media, no news media, no newspaper, but there are currently a handful of different fake news sites that are ABC channel 15 Elkhart.com. And most of the, the news stories on that are true. They're from Reuters or the AP, but the headline is something fake. It's a meme. Um, the most recent one I saw was encouraging uh, vigilante justice. And that same news story encouraging vigilante justice in the small town is copy and paste in Kokomo, Bloomington, um, all in these small towns all around Indiana and Michigan and all throughout the United States that are encouraging, in this particular case, vigilante justice. And it doesn't say Elkhart, it says ABC uh, Bloomington or ABC Urbana um, as a way of encouraging certain behaviors via memes. And the way that we can counteract that is to have trusted local news again. Um, that's something that's gone away. I don't have a, the policy to how to do that that's escaped me right now, but that's something that I am worried about um, into the near future, um, especially with the rise of, like, like I was talking about, these memes and, and fake, uh, fake imagery. So I'm hearing there, I think, two recommendations. One is uh, that institutions like yours and other academics can help be part of the media ecosystem and the fact-checking ecosystem. You can use your technology to sort of Hey, look at this. See, this is this is maybe like a blinking red light. Somebody should go look at yeah, this. Like a warning system of types. Yeah. Yeah, like an early warning system. And so then other media can go investigate. Uh, but then we also need to reinforce and strengthen our local media. And particularly, we're seeing this growing trend of uh, fake news masquerading as, as real lo uh, local news. And then yeah. the, and the kind of the, ing the ingeniousness of it is that there is no local news to call it out. Right, because it's gone now. So right. um, yeah. you have to kind of respect the uh, the, the brilliance of it, um, as much as you hate it. You have to respect it. it it's it's a good move. President Nakao, you, you know your thoughts here. I know I, I, a couple of different topics there you might want to take on. One is the role of local media. Um, I, I'm also I'm interested in your thoughts on financial media. You know, if I think of financial markets as a measure of sentiment. How do you see misinformation and disinformation playing out in, in financial uh, media? Uh, you're on mute, sir. So before answering to your questions, uh, uh, I want to add uh, uh, several more troubles or damages from uh, the uh, misinformation. It's not just a misinformation or disinformation, but it's a stereotype or cliche type ideas or the biased ideas so about uh, a certain, I mean, ethnic uh, group or whatever. So it's not just uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation, which is harmful, Exager exaggerated the ways of uh, uh, depicting a certain character. So uh, uh, regarding, and also uh, if uh, there are too many uh, kind of flaming or di uh, difficult issues coming from this, it in a sense uh, causes uh, trouble by making people speak just the correct things without uh, uh, saying what uh, they really believe uh, or scientific uh, things. Uh, so they try to, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, address, accommodate uh, the feeling of a social media before they speak uh, uh, what they really believe 
so that is another issue. So in the end, we lose uh, the right of uh, uh, expression as well as the right of uh, knowing real things by these uh, things. So, and what is a remedy? And I think, uh, of course, uh, certain penalties needed like a libel or uh, the defamations, especially about the individuals, attack on individuals uh, on the groundless way or exaggerated way. And how about uh, the uh, uh, untrue facts uh, regarding medicine or whatever? And I think uh, it is, uh, I'm really cautious about uh, the state control of information in that regard, except uh, attacking uh, individuals. Because uh, in the human history, we have had a very bad experiences of state control, including uh, in militaristic uh, Japan in 1930s. So uh, they uh, enacted uh, the law of uh, a kind of social order together with the suffrage of a uh, male in 1925 to keep a society more stable. But uh, that is uh, now leading to the controlling of information uh, and uh, repression, repressions of uh, the uh, different opinions and even concocting uh, the uh, misinformation by the authorities themselves, including uh, the situations of a war affair with the United States, for instance. So it is really damaging to have a state control. So we need to address these issues uh, more from uh, private sectors, NPOs, academicians, and so on. So I, I think uh, now uh, the government of Japan promotes a private sector-led approach to this uh, dissemination, including fact check uh, operators or AI to monitor the uh, website uh, uh, website uh, to to check uh, the untrue or uh, the exaggerated ideas uh, exaggerated attack on the peoples and so on. So we need uh, such uh, 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 policies or the uh, measures. But I, I'm uh, really against the idea of a very strong uh, state control. So we don't need state. You're you're opposed to the idea of state control, but we do need a stronger set of tools out there to help spotlight these issues, and we need legal frameworks that recognize. Um, libel and other uh, um, uh, risks or, or uh, downsides to spreading misinformation and impose penalties uh, on, on individuals when they yeah, do that. Yeah, especially regarding the peoples. I mean, right. uh, attack on the people. Yeah, because it really is damaging to the individuals. Mm. And how are you seeing misinformation? Do you see misinformation playing out differently in financial markets or in financial media? Well, yeah, of course, in, uh, uh, the misinformation, places? I'm sorry, uh, that uh, already manipulations uh, or uh, using a rumor to manipulate the market is a penalty, penalized. And also, of course, uh, the insider trade and other misuse of information is already illegal in the security uh, kind of uh, uh, market. So uh, there are a lot of discussions about uh, what is uh, wrong and what is not. And there are too uh, many uh, kind of uh, the new uh, 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 new, new uh, operators using uh, AI and so on. So we must address those issues because the speed is and also spread of information is too, so quick. So uh, we must uh, uh, grade up uh, those uh, uh, regulations. Richard, can, can, yeah, I ask, can I ask a quick question? Um, you said that, and I understand that, for example, in the United States, that um, you are not allowed to use rumor to move financial markets. How, how often is that actually enforced? I don't know, because it's very difficult to tell uh, who started rumor and what is wrong information. Of course, it is also related to the freedom of expression, freedom of speech, opinions. <laughs> so uh, if it is uh, intentionally used to move the market, it is uh, regarding manipulation. But uh, I don't know whether uh, it is uh, sufficient or not sufficient at all. But at least uh, what, what, the worst thing can be caught. Yeah. Yeah. I do know that, I, I know, like, as an example, there was a high profile case with uh, Elon Musk who tweeted out what I think he think, well, I think he was trying to make some jokes, um, but the, he tweeted some things out that ended up moving the stock price. And he did end up paying penalties, uh, SEC imposed penalties. That's right, that's right. Uh, for, for that. um, Marion, I want to come to you. Um, I mean, I, you, I, you called on us to be skeptical, to have a civil dialogue with you. But um, when you reflect on what would you like to see differently in, in corporate policy or in public policy when it comes to how we deal with misinformation, disinformation? Well, I think it starts with how do we educate our children? I think the first thing we need to do, just the way it would be criminal in effect, um, not to teach our children to read and to write and to do basic mathematical literacy. I think it would be, it's equally criminal not to teach them media literacy from the very, very beginning. 
And I think that we need to mandate that from um, day one of their schooling to teach them to think critically, to think analytically, to be skeptical, to teach them to um, validate and to learn how to um, really uh, establish what is an objective fact. And I think that that really starts with our educational systems and, and teaching children how to really learn how to differentiate between fact and opinion. And so media literacy as an educational tool, I think is, is ground zero. Um, it's unfortunate, but I think also as adults, we need to go back and be re-educated because I think many of us, um, even if we were thought, taught to think critically, may not have the kind of media literacy skills we need to have in this world. I consider myself a literate person, but sometimes I'll find myself going down. I hate to admit it, but that rabbit hole of just reading the link and forwarding it to someone and then going and putting it in my file to go back to read later. And okay, admittedly, my trusted sources are the economist or business insider. So maybe I'm not as guilty as some of the others you're referring to, but I now know that you've just actually, you've just taught me a new stop behavior. But I think that we all need to learn that that's just such an important do not do. And I think we need to teach people at all ages, but starting with children, um, just to sort of stop the feeding frenzy of um, the fake news spread. And I think Thank it's a you. super important thing. Yeah, no, thank you, Marian. Um, I do want to, again, come back to our audience. Uh, we've got about eight minutes left. I want to encourage you to, to be using our hashtag of hashtag call out misinfo. If you have questions, we've gotten a couple, please put some Q&A uh, into the, or to put your questions into the Q&A function, um, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, but Tim, I want to come back to you. Marian raised the issue of, um, of media literacy, and I know you've been studying this and looking at different programs in the Indo-Pacific. What are you seeing that's working and, and, and what, what, what might be brought to scale? Yeah, uh, so that's, that's a great question. Um, a, a few things. So uh, Marion raised kind of two dis, uh, points. And one is the in schools media literacy. Um, so there are uh, many programs um, that are, are aimed at school age children and high school children about, uh, but I have to say, uh, and then those are those are needed and useful, but I would say that most of the high school and junior um, like ch children understand the ecosystem much better than their parents do. Um, and so, so I'm not, the, the kids will be all right. I worry about people my age and older um, who didn't grow up um, with an understanding of this. And also there, there's a huge opportunity in the fact that in the next, well, in the past maybe three or four and then going into the next three or four years, a large proportion of the of the global population will come online. And when they do come online, they're gonna start seeing headlines and news and opinions and they're out of school now, they're my age. Um, and when they go to Facebook or Reddit or, or Twitter or, or WhatsApp, what, kind, what are they gonna see? And uh, are they equipped to, to understand how news is spread, to understand that not everything is true, to understand that this image can be manipulated and so I think media literacy is important for school-aged children, but it's more important for um, new digital arrivals. So those folks who are out of school, uh, my age and older, who are just now getting the internet um, or kind of grokking what is this social media and how can they use it effectively. Um, and so what is working? The th games. Games are actually working. We have a game, if you go to, uh, well, in Indonesia, it's literata.ad, there's a game that you can play that will teach you, um, it's kind of like a simulated WhatsApp group that uh, you can go and then it, it's, it's encouraging you or, or showing you how to um, politely um, and effectively uh, combat misinformation within your friend groups. And so there's different options about ways you can respond when someone says something that's um, forgive me, uh, BS, right? How, how to call it out. <laughs> and um, those types of kind of fun, interesting games that are interactive and engaging have shown to be really, really uh, effective and useful. And it's just a matter of getting people to, to go to them and understand uh, kind of the ecosystem. And, um, and it's especially useful, like I said, for those who are no longer in school who are just now coming online. Mm. What's the name of the game again? Well, it's, it's in Bahasa, Indonesia, so it's called uh, Literata. Um, but uh, we will shortly have, there's another one uh, that's, that's in England um, called um, uh, Harmony Square. 
So this, mm. that's what in English for it's called Harmony Square. I wasn't I'm not responsible for Harmony Square, but it's the same kind of it's teaching you um, the way in a fun and interactive game, the way that disinformation spreads and what you can do to combat it. Gotcha. Um, so what I'm hearing there is that, well, I, I think one of the big challenges we have is that there's a group of people both in the United States and abroad who uh, think of, of the internet as Facebook. Uh, that, that That is their extent of it. And I know Marion called for media literacy in our schools. I'm hearing you call for media literacy in our nursing homes, perhaps, for, for, <laughs> for the older group who need more, uh, more education. On, on how these things actually work uh, and some gamification is always is always helpful. Um, we've got about three minutes left. And what I, I, the, one of the questions that's come through and that I, I wanna pose to each of you is that this is a really complex challenge and it can feel very overwhelming for us as individuals. But if I'm sitting in the audience right now, what can I do? What could I do differently? What, pu what public policy could I advocate for? Or is there some behavior that I could change personally that would help uh, with combating misinformation, disinformation. And Marianne, I'm gonna to come to you first on that. I think um, start to go back to the plain old analog way of look for source materials. I can't um, begin to tell you how valuable source materials are, whether it's source materials that companies like ours put on um, file for people to use to verify or something else, but source materials are a, a really, I, I think a great place to start. So I'm going to go back to what you said in your opening, trust but verify and look for source materials. Yep. Love it. Um, uh, President Nakao, your thoughts? Yeah, today uh, we are not just receivers of information, but we are also producers and spreaders of information. And we should act as a responsible actor by knowing uh, that we are responsible for those things. And also, I want to add that the platform companies should be regulated in terms of taxations, data, and of course, uh, the informations and uh, uh, the financing uh, uh, kind of gains they get. So two monopolistic powers, two strong powers in the society. So even if uh, their intention is not bad and also it uh, has a lot of service freely, but I think uh, if uh, everything is more controlled by, by those uh, I mean, platform companies, it is eventually has a negative impact. But uh, uh, regarding individual, we must uh, act as a responsible spreader or information producer. So be a responsible a producer and spreader of information. Take your responsibility as our brother or sister's editor and curator seriously and uh, advocate for public policies that regulate tech platforms and avoid uh, the negative monopolistic behaviors mm -hmm. that can result. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Tim, I'm gonna give you the final word here, individual behavior change. Yeah, uh, I wanna echo um, the pre previous presenters. Um, the biggest thing is to uh, realize that you are the editor of your friend's newsfeed. Um, that's a responsibility that we all have and we have to take, take seriously. And the second is to realize and recognize uh, and then tell, teach other people that uh, people are trying to uh, dupe you. They're, they're trying to get you to behave in ways that are contrary to your own interests. Um, people are trying to trick you and uh, to, to just be on the lookout for that kind of thing. And don't be duped. Don't, don't be a victim to, to fake news. So, <laughs> so be aware, uh, be responsible, um, and be skeptical while also, I think I'll, I'll, I'll add into there being civil uh, as, as you do that. So um, thank you all. Thank you, uh, President Nakao. Thank you, Professor Winninger. Thank you, Marian Salzman. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. So grateful for your insights, and I'm so grateful to Concordia and Concordia Live for making this all possible and for uh, Philip Morris International for sponsoring. So thank you all so much for today's conversation, and uh, please do continue to share your thoughts uh, online using the hashtag uh, calloutmisinfo. And with that, I'll close today's session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.